Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to see everyone today. I feel like 2020 was a time for a significant trial for most people, uh, to some extent, right? Maybe it was the trial of either worrying about the coronavirus or having the coronavirus. Uh, maybe it was the trial of being locked in your house with your family and you realize you didn't love your family as much as you thought you did. Uh, whatever it may be, I feel like uh, most of us, maybe not everyone in here, but I feel like most of us to some extent went through some sort of trial. And I was no different. Uh, the past 15 months, there have been two major trials in my life. The first one, and the one I'm going to talk about today, has been my, I've had like numerous health problems after numerous health problems. It started, I think in like November or so, I had this tooth infection that I had for like two or three months that I just couldn't afford to fix and it caused constant pain and I finally got that fixed. Uh, I got extremely sick twice. I don't normally get sick, but I mean, this was the sickest I'd ever been. Kind of believe I had COVID in February, even though people said that wasn't really a thing yet. I mean, I got extremely sick to the point where I couldn't like eat, like I was sick for a couple days and then it took like three weeks to get over it. I had, if some of you remember, I had poison ivy this summer for like a straight month and I couldn't get rid of that and that was miserable. Waking up at 3 a.m. in the morning with an itchy body is one of the worst things in, in the world. Uh, I had, <laughs> I had my chest problem where it was like six months of my chest hurting and at first I thought it could be my heart and so that caused stress. Then I was in the middle of Target and I like almost passed out in the middle of the store, which was crazy. And then to top it all off, the, about a month ago, as many of you know, I got a concussion. And uh, I thought it was better, and now it came back. And so I have something called post-concussion syndrome. So if you may have noticed, I wasn't, you probably didn't notice, because I'm usually back there, but I wasn't in the sanctuary, because the music is just like blasting into my head. So I was hanging out out there. And so it's been health problem after health problem. And uh, there's the, been two major problems with that. Is one, like I can't play with my kids the way I want to. Like I want to just beat them up and throw them and do what dads do with their kids. But like physically, I just, there's a lot of been a lot of preventions for that. And not just that, I haven't been able to work out in the past 15 months for more than a two month stretch. Like I haven't been able to work out. And when I don't work out, I don't feel like myself. Like, like I don't feel like the person that I, I normally do. And plus I've put on a couple LBs because I haven't been able to work out. And so all that has been such a trial for me and so frustrating. But through this time, there's been one text that has been my go-to text in the Bible. There's been one scripture which has significantly helped me get through all this. And I, I don't want to over-exaggerate it here, but this scripture has literally been revolutionary in my life in helping me get through the trials that I'm going through. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to look at this text. And this text is found in, in James 1, 1 through 5. And then after that, we're going to circle back around and go to Proverbs to finish up the series. But what we're going to see is this. This is the main idea we're going to see today. Is that God's end goal in your life is to make you more like Jesus. Yeah. That God's main agenda in your life is to make you more like Jesus. Right. And when you can start to understand that, when you can start to see the world through that lens, it'll change the way you look at life. And it has changed the way that I have looked at trials. And so we're starting James chapter 1, and then we're going to finish up the series of Proverbs this week by looking at Proverbs chapter 1. We're actually going to end where Steve started at. So James 1, 1 through 5, just five short verses here. We're going to go through it verse by verse. It starts out by saying this. James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion. Greetings. So we can read right over this verse, but we see two main things here. The first thing we see is who it's written to, or who it's written by, and the second thing is who it's written to. This is written by a guy named James. And you may remember from our James series, uh, uh, probably a year and a half ago now, that James was the brother of Jesus. The thing about Jesus' family is when Jesus was alive, nobody believed that he was who he said he was. No one believed that he was God. And you would do the same thing, right? If your brother or sister walked up to you and said, hey, I'm God and I'm here to die for the sins of the world. You'd be like, no, you're not. I, I've seen you grow up. I, I've seen you get beat up by me in the backyard. I've seen you beat someone else up in the backyard. I've seen you poop. God doesn't poop, right? So you would see that, and you would be like, you're not God. And so that's how James felt here, that he wasn't God. But, but what ends up happening is Jesus dies, and then he raises back to life. And when James sees that, he believes that Jesus is who he says he is. And so this is the brother of Jesus who believes that Jesus is who he says he is. And he's writing this to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. So the 12 tribes is, if you have an a Old Testament background or understanding, the 12 tribes were, was what Israel was broken up to and what James is, is writing to here is Christians to the new 12 tribes, basically saying that we are the new Israel. 
And so those who were in the dispersion are those who were separated or scattered. What happens in Acts chapter 8 is there's a bunch of persecution that comes upon the church, and all the people in Jerusalem have to scatter and go abroad. So he's writing to all the people who have been through persecution. Now you may say, why, why does that matter? This is important because they have been through real persecution. They have been through real trial. They have literally had to leave their house. They literally had to leave their jobs in fear for their life because they were Christians and because they stood up for the faith. The people that James are writing to are people who literally had to leave everything they had or they would have been killed because they were Christians. Now, I'm not saying you haven't had bad things happen in your life. I'm not saying there might have been some slight persecution, but none of us in here have been through real persecution like we read in the Bible. Until we get to the point where our president is hanging our bodies up and cutting off our heads and lighting them as torches and feeding us to lions, we haven't been through real persecution. So I want you to understand this because we've got to understand that James is about to talk about trials, and these people have been through real deep trials. Like they've been through real painful stuff, stuff that has hurt them real deeply. What I don't want you to do, you can do two things when we're about to read this text. The first thing you can do is say, James doesn't understand the trials that I've been through. James doesn't understand what I've been through. But we see here he's writing to a group of people, including himself, who had to literally flee Jerusalem because he was going to die. If he can say this about himself and say this to these people, the trial that you're going through, which is real and hard and tough, just like my trial, uh, he, can, he can speak to that as well. The second thing we can do is minimize whatever trial you're going through or minimize the trial that someone else is going through. Maybe you're going through something and you feel like it's not that big of a deal compared to what these guys were going through. Uh, it's kind of like the sixth grader who comes home and is like, my life is over because his girlfriend or her boyfriend broke up with her, right? And to that person, that's real pain at that moment. Now, to us, we know that person's going to get over it in a couple days or a couple weeks. But to that person, it's real pain in that moment. And so what we have to understand is whatever trial you're going through, James is speaking to. Whether it's something horribly deep or something maybe as simple as health troubles like I've been having. James is about to speak to that. I want you to think of the trials that you've been going through. I think about the struggles that you've been having. God is literally about to speak towards that in, in James chapter 1, verse 2 here. So he says this in James 1, 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Now, when we hear this, it can be like, when I'm going through trials, I'm just supposed to be happy, la di da la di di because everything's good. And, and that is so hard to say when you're looking at a dead body, right? Like, like, that's so hard to say when you get a diagnosis that is terminal. That is so hard to say when you're looking at something tough and rough. Like, like have joy. I, I didn't have joy when I looked at a five-year-old in a casket because his head got blown off with a shotgun. And I didn't have joy when, my, when one of my football players committed suicide and was gone. And, and his teammates didn't have joy. Like, are we supposed to tell people to have joy in that moment? I think we've got to read this verse in context. We've got to understand that he's going to tell us why to have joy. He's not telling us to have joy simply because we should be happy in those moments. Because if we act like we're happy all the time, what can happen is we're minimizing people's pain around us. And what can even happen is we can become so delusional that we're minimizing our pain and acting like we don't have any. And so he's not saying just be happy, just have joy, just because. He's going to tell us why we should have joy. We can't get to the what before the why. And so there's impossible moments for you to have joy, and you need to acknowledge that. There's impossible moments where you feel pain. So why should we have joy? He, he lays this out for us in verse 3. He says, For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. So the first thing we see is we get a definition of what trial is. A trial is the testing of your faith. And the reason we're supposed to have joy is because trial produces steadfastness, or your Bible might say perseverance. So it's kind of like this. So I, I coach high school football, and I coach uh, freshmen in the weight room. That's kind of my job in the weight room. So I'll, I'll coach freshmen. Every year they come into the weight room, and they're miserable at lifting weights, right? They, they're just horrible. So they do something called a squat. If you know how to squat, which some of you may in the weight room, you're supposed to get the parallel. You're supposed to keep your eyes up, keep your back flat, not hunch over. Every single freshman that comes in and squats, here's what they do. They put the bar across their back. They lean forward, and they go like this. Now, that's horrible for your back. You're not going to get any stronger that way, but almost every single freshman, when they come in, they go like this every single time. And when they bench, it's even worse. They take the bar out in front of them. You're supposed to, when you bench, you're supposed to bring the bar down to your chest. But here's what they do. They lift it off the rack, and they go, one, two, three. That's not getting you any stronger. You need to get a full range of motion to get strength and clean. Now, when I talk about clean, I'm not talking about like, 
cleaning like this. There's a, there's a lift called a clean. So you bring it up, it's all about your hips. You're getting your hips and you're exploding up. And you're supposed to get those elbows out in front of you. Every time they take that bar and they just throw it up like this. And it's, it's horrible. It's bad for them. They got spaghetti arms, right? And they have no idea what they're doing. But if they persevere and they keep going, what ends up happening by the end of their senior year, their form is beautiful. They look, they look good while they're doing it and they get much stronger. Instead of being able just to bench press 45 pound bar, they're able to bench press 250, 300 pounds if they keep working and persevering. And so that's what happens. As they grow and as they get older, they, they persevere and, and, they, and they build endurance. And so what James is saying here, when you go through trials, what happens is you have the chance to persevere. You have the chance to endure. So count it all joy, because when you count it all joy, what happens is you end up persevering in endurance, having endurance. So, so why do we do that? Do we do that for just the sake of steadfastness? Do we do that so we can be tough? No, James is going to tell us why we should persevere here in verse 4. And in verse 4, he says this. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. I'll read that again. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And so what ends up happening is as you persevere, as you endure, as you become more steadfast, you become more perfect. Now, the truth is you won't become perfect until you're in heaven in the full presence of God. But if we could say this a different way, as you persevere, as you become more steadfast, you turn more into the image of Jesus. When trial happens, you have a choice to either persevere or endure. And if you do persevere and endure, that turns you more into the image of Jesus. It makes you more into the image of him. And so what we need to understand is that God's end goal in our life, and even through trial, is that we would look more and more like Jesus. Here's one of the best pieces of advice I'd ever heard in a sermon. He said this, and it's really helped me over the past year and a half or so. God's end goal in your life is not just for you to be happy, but to be holy. God's goal isn't just for you to be happy, but to be holy. Now, I'm not saying he doesn't want you to be happy. I'm not saying that that's not important. But his end goal in your life is for you to become more holy and for you to look more like Jesus. And so God either allows some trials, right, because some things he doesn't send, or he sends some trials into your life to make you more like him, to shape and to mold you more into the image of Jesus He's trying to make you holy. Now, please don't listen. Please don't hear and say that God, I'm saying God doesn't want you to be happy because I feel like he does. It even talks about joy in this text. But his end goal is for you to have more than happiness, but to have a holiness where you reflect the image of Jesus. And then we can stake it one step further in, in verse 5. Verse 5 says this. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. Now, when, when I've heard this text before, I've often heard like people say, like, just ask God for wisdom and he'll lead you in the right direction. That's true to some extent, but I've had, been in situations where I've asked God for wisdom and I haven't gotten led in a direction, right? Some of you may ask God for wisdom. Should I take this job or that job? Should I take this path or that path? Should I marry this person or not this person? And there's been times in my life where I've had those situations and I've asked God and I haven't gotten an answer, right? Because this text literally says, God will give it to you if you believe. It goes on to talk about if you don't have doubt. What it's talking about is not just general wisdom. What it's actually talking about when you read it in context, it's talking about wisdom and how your trials make you more like Jesus. So what this text is telling us is when we have trials, when we're going through things, we can bring that to God and ask God and say, God, how does this make me more like Jesus? I've never been through a trial and asked God for wisdom in that trial and him not giving me an answer. I'll say that again. I've never been through a trial and asked for wisdom in that trial and God not giving me an answer. <clears throat> like, thinking through with my whole health thing, there's been two things even this week where I'm like, God, why is this going on? Like, I don't want this concussion. Please take it away. And there's been numerous things that he has taught me through this and shaped me and molded me into the image of Jesus. One of those things is uh, I was sitting there and I knew I had to do piecemeals on Wednesday. Tuesday was the worst day of the week for my head. And so I knew that I had a really long week ahead, a really long day ahead of me on Wednesday. I was like, God, I, I don't have the strength to make it through tomorrow. Like, I don't think I can do this tomorrow with the way my head's hurting and how frustrated I am. I don't think I can make it through it. 
And then I was thinking about how I had to go to the doctors and drive to Monticello. And then I was like, man, I got to eat lunch with Steve Royce. That's not going to be fun. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That was actually the best part of my day, Steve. And uh, I was thinking about how I was going to have to drive all over and then go to football to end the day. I was like, I can't do this. And then what God showed me and revealed to me is that, hey, you can trust me. You can rely on me. You don't trust me in the way that I want you to. Like, like you can't trust me to get you through the day. How are you going to trust me to get, me through, get you through this life? And he showed me that through the trial that I was going through. And he does that often to me. Now you may ask, how does God tell me these things? It's not like he's like, bruh, like that, right? That's, that's not how God reveals things to us primarily. Uh, usually what will happen, a lot of times what will happen is in relationship and in, in Christian fellowship. The person you're talking to has the Holy Spirit inside of them. And, and through talking to them, God will reveal something to you about yourself. I don't know how many times this happened to me, especially when I'm talking to chastity. She'll, she'll say, point out something to me. Uh, what will also happen is the Holy Spirit will do something called illumination, where he, will, where he will bring something up inside of you, bring an idea or thought inside of your spirit, and uh, that's him showing you something. Uh, and so God does this in multiple ways, but usually not through like a voice. But God will reveal to you, hey, here's how I'm trying to make you more like Jesus. Here's how I'm trying to shape and change and mold you. If you remembered, I'm going to talk about some here. Uh, if you remembered at the beginning, I said there's been two major trials that I have went through in the past past year and a half. Uh, the this one uh, we were talking about with Chastity, trying to decide when to share and how to share it. Uh, but the second trial has been my oldest son Bronson, and uh, we have noticed that he's had like so he's been just real crazy like the past year or so. We've been trying to like figure out what to do. Part of me, just for like half this past year, half of 2020, was like just feeling like a horrible dad because like I just couldn't figure out how to parent him right. I couldn't figure out what to do with him. And so we ended up taking him to the doctor, and he's been officially diagnosed with ADD and ODD. Uh, and uh, don't know what those are. I'd love to talk to you about it. But he's been unofficially diagnosed, and he will be diagnosed very soon once he can get into a, a counselor with a highly functioning autism. And so uh, if you don't know much about autism, highly functioning autism is like as good as it gets on the autistic spe spectrum. Like if he gets officially diagnosed with this, he'll be able to live a normal life and all that. And everything will be, will be awesome uh, with that. And he'll be able, we'll be able to help him work and learn with it. But it's caused just so much chaos in our house the past year. So much arguing, so much fighting, so much frustration. And honestly, a lot of just not feeling like we're good enough parents because we just can't. We can't figure out what to do with him sometimes. And it's, it's very aggravating. Just to give you a couple ideas of like some things that he'll do. I'll give you one really good thing that happens with his autism and one like really like frustrating thing. But for example, he remembers everything. No matter what you tell him, he'll remember. When he was one and a half, I was in the grocery store with him. Remember, he's three and a half now. He was one and a half in the grocery store. I pointed at this candy that I liked up on the shelf. I was like, hey, this is one of daddy's favorite candies. Never said anything to him about it. Never said anything to Chastity about it. This Valentine's Day, he's in that same store, walking through the store, looking for candy for me for Valentine's Day. He's like, hey, mommy, that's one of daddy's favorite candies. I mean, this was almost two years ago, and he still remembers, his memory is crazy. We'll just be driving down the street. I'll be like, hey, dad, you remember that one time we seen a lantern in the sky? And it was like, that was like two years ago, buddy. How do you remember that? His, his memory is amazing, and it's awesome. But there's other things where, like, he just freaks out about textures, like any sort of texture, water gets on him, gets a little mud on him. He had a sliver in his hand, it almost caused World War III at our house. I mean, he just freaks out about everything and it's just so hard sometimes. And um, yeah, just stuff like that. Or like, we didn't raise him like, to, when we tell him like no, like we, we didn't give in when he kept yelling at us. But like, we'll tell him no about something, he'll just keep arguing and arguing and arguing and arguing and arguing because he's just so stubborn. And it falls into the autistic spectrum. So it's caused a bunch of trials, right? And this is a lot about me. I wasn't planning to go that deep into it. But just to show you, that, that's the trials that I've been through. But time and time again, almost every time I'm frustrated or angry, God is teaching me something through these trials. And he's shaping and molding me. He's working me into his image. I don't know how many times I thought I was the most patient person in the world. And then Bronson just pushed and pushed and pushed. And I've seen I wasn't near as patient as God is with me. That's what God does. Whatever trial you're going through, God is trying to work inside of you right now and make you more like him. He's working inside of everything that's going on in you. So, 
That's James. Let's kind of just jump real quick into Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. Don't worry, we're almost done. Proverbs chapter 1, or sorry, verse 8. This is where Steve started out the series at. And it says this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instructions. When you look at Proverbs, what you have to realize is that wisdom and knowledge comes from God. And if you're just looking at Proverbs as helpful tidbits to make you successful, it'll end up failing you, and you'll have false hope. The real treasure of Proverbs is this, is knowing that God is the one who's all-wise and all-powerful and all-perfect, and we come to him because we love him and we fear him and we know who he is. We come to him, and through that, we grow and we learn. It's through Proverbs, the main goal of Proverbs is this, God's trying to make you more like him. That's right. God's trying to make you more like Jesus. Amen. It's more than just a tidbit here or a little bit on, on this area here. God is using Proverbs to try to make you more like Jesus. Right. Jesus is the perfect fulfillment of Proverbs. If you look at Proverbs, you see Jesus is the perfect fulfillment of it. Let me give you one last illustration and we'll be done here. I heard this this past week and I thought it was amazing. Let's say this. Let's say that I come home and I walk in the house and there's a guy named Tim there. I'm like, Tim, what you doing? He's like, hey, Brett, well, I've noticed what kind of husband you are and what kind of father you are. I feel like I could be a b better husband and father than you. How do you think I would respond to that? Like, not, not good, right? Yeah, yeah maybe. I, I might give him a good socket and call the police and get him out of my house. Or, or vice versa. Let's say Chastity walks home and there's someone named Susan there. Sorry if your name's Susan and you're listening on Facebook. Uh, but let's say Susan's there. And Susan is like, Chastity, I've noticed some things about you, and I feel like I can be a better husband to Brett and a better, a better uh, uh, mom to Sterling and Bronson. How would she respond? She would definitely do that, what Bobby just did. She would definitely do that. Probably not. She'd get me and get me to kick the Susan out of my house. But we would respond that way. The truth is, is that we've done that to God. We've done that to God over and over and over. God is king, and he's made this world to work and function in such a way. And we come before God and we're, we act like king. We act like we can take his place. Proverbs is trying to show us how to put God back on the throne and how to make him king of our life. Amen. And so I hope through this series, you've kind of got to see how God is doing that in your life. Maybe it was when we talked about how you use your words. Maybe you put yourself on the throne instead of him. Maybe it's when we talked about what true wisdom is and you try to find wisdom in yourself instead of God. Our goal is to put God back on the throne, and that's what the book of Proverbs right. is trying to do. So, what I'm actually going to do, and I'm actually going to walk out for a little bit, just so you guys know, because the music really drives me nuts. I got some questions. Austin, if you could throw those questions on the screen for me. I got some questions for you to think about. Uh, we'll just do this for three to five minutes, and I'll come back in and pray and close this down. But uh, think through some of these questions. Question one is, what trial have you been through in the past? Question two, how has God used that trial to make you more like Jesus? What trial are you currently going through now? How do you think God is trying to make you more like Jesus through these trials? And then last, you can take time and pray for wisdom on how this trial is making you more like Jesus. And we're going to turn on some elevator music because that's the only music Facebook will let us play without dinging us. And so if you take time and just kind of dwell over that for three to five minutes, I'll come back in and then we'll pray and, and close it up. So I hope you got some time there to uh, talk to God, kind of process what your trials are, ha what are happening with your trials and how God is working inside of you. A couple quick announcements. Uh, first one is we have tween group this Wednesday, so we will have this this Wednesday, as well as Bob mentioned earlier. We are starting our Bible study on Revelation on Wednesday as well, so we'd love to have you to either of those if, if uh, you're a tween group to tween, and then if not, to that Revelation study. That'll be at 6.30 on, on Wednesday. And just a heads up for tween group, as I mentioned in my note home, uh, I'm starting football this week. Practice starts on Wednesday, so I can't promise I'll be here any earlier than 6.20. So uh, if I'm here, kids are more than free to be here when I'm here, but I can't promise I'll, I won't get here till that time. So let me pray for us, and then we'll be dismissed and good to go. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this series that we've been through on Proverbs and how we can look at it and find true knowledge and true wisdom, the way that you built the world and designed the world to be. I pray that we, as followers of you, will submit to that and trust in that. 
leave you on the throne instead of putting ourselves up there. That we see that you, fear of you, is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. I want to pray for whatever trials people are going through right now, Lord. I pray that you take them out of that trial, Lord. But in the midst of the trial, I pray that you show them how you're trying to work in their heart. How you're trying to make them more like Jesus. I pray we see our lives just not as us just trying to go around and be as happy as we can get by accumulating the most stuff and fulfilling our most desires, but see that ultimately you're trying to make us more like you. Our life is not just about being happy, but being holy. And I pray you work that inside of our hearts, that you change and shape and mold us into your image. And as you do that, we change and shape and mold the world around us into the world that you designed it to be. Lord, we love you. Uh, We thank you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Have a great week. And that was Proverbs 1-7. 1-7. Yeah. Just so people can live in.